So good morning. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers. It's an honor to be able to present our work in such a special occasion for the 70th birthday of Professor Srinivasan. The work is in collaboration with him and with Dan Latrop from the University of Maryland, in which lab the experiment will be carried out. The title is Quantized Vortices Following Reconnections. And um, as we've heard even yesterday from Professor Skripak, superfluid helium can be considered a mixture of uh, two components, a superfluid component, which is an inviscid fluid, and a normal component, which is a viscous fluid. The normal component drops in favor of the superfluid component as you cool down through the lambda transition. And in um, our experiment, we studied the range of values, of range of temperature between 1.8 Kelvin and the lambda transition. But most of the data will be collected at uh, 2 Kelvin, where the um, fraction of superfluid component and normal component is uh, somewhat uh, similar. So we know that uh, superfluid helium is uh, as an irrotational, superfluid flow is irrotational. So the only vorticity is uh, on quantized vortices, which are topological defects. And the circulation are multiple of the quantum circulation, which is, oops. Is, um, which is the ratio between the Planck constant and the mass of the helium atom. So these vortices are macroscopic in length, but of atomic size and width. And the other ends at the walls or loop around themselves in the rings or knots. An evolving set of these quantized vortices is what we call quantum turbulence. You can see here some renderings of the vortex tangle. You can see here, for example, also a vortex ring. So uh, quantum turbulence has several similarities with classical turbulence. For example, the pressure drops along pipes, the drag on a sphere, the vorticity decay, the Kolmogorov energy spectrum, and the fourth fifth law are all in common with classical turbulence. However, there are important distinctions. For example, in the velocity distribution, which in the quantum turbulence is strongly non-Gaussian one over Q power tails as you can see from the plot. And this data is collected by Pauletti, Fischer, Srinivasan, and Latrop at the University of Maryland using a visualization technique which are introduced later. So these uh, one over VQ power load tails are due to the reconnection events and the singular nature of the vortices. However, Gaussianity is restored at scale bigger than the intervortex spacing, as has been shown by Bagley and Parenghi in simulations and by Lamanti and Skirbeck in um, experiments. Similar results have been obtained also in both ions and condensates. Another difference between quantum and classical turbulence is dissipation in the range of temperature between around 0.6 Kelvin and the lamp transition. The main dissipation mechanism in quantum turbulence is interaction with the vortices with the normal component, which is a uh, finite viscosity. However, in the T equals zero limit, the viscosity is equal to zero. So um, the main dissipation mechanism is different, and the theory suggests that there are, uh, the main mechanism are reconnection, which excite Kelvin waves, and then there is Kelvin waves cascades, which for more, smaller and smaller scales, and eventually the energy is emitted by phonons. So vortex reconnection has been theorized by Feynman in the 50s, you can see here a uh, vortex loop breaking down in smaller loops. And in general, reconnection con consider uh, two vortices getting together, exchanging tails, and then separating quickly afterwards. You can see here uh, a simulation by Chichiro Rai using uh, a gross Pitayevsky equation. You can see the two vortices approaching together, uh, rearranging themselves into anti-parallel configuration and then separating afterwards. You can see the same things by these um, uh, schematics by Schwartz, the two orthogonal vortices are getting together, rearranging themselves into anti-parallel configuration. You can see here the red arrows are in the opposite direction of the blue arrows. Mm -hmm. And there is a local uh, dynamics at this small scale, and then there is a global dynamics on the scale of this, uh, of this, uh, uh, angle theta, which you can see here. And this evolution of these vortices after reconnection 
is what leads also to the uh, Kelvin waves cascade. And these Kelvin waves are um, propagation of helical perturbation on a vortex with a small core in an incompressible inviscid fluid. So it well um, describes um, waves in the quantum vortices. So the theory was developed by Kelvin to uh, develop a theory of vortex atoms. So as we know, vortex atoms are not successful in describing matter, but the theory was very successful in describing other things. For example, uh, the theory of uh, Kelvin waves is used to, this, to understand airplane wakes, tornadoes, neutron star dynamics, and are related even to Whistler waves in plasmas. Until up to recently, with the visualization technique, they have been only detected indirectly in quantum vortices using torsional oscillators by looking at the anomaly in the velocity of ions moving along the vortices in a transverse electric field and the damping of oscillation in both ions and condensates. So um, the visualization technique um, that lead to the direct visualization of Kelvin waves is based on the trapping of some particles um, into the vortex core due to a Bernoulli pressure gradient that sucks the particles in the vortex core. This theory was developed in the 60s and 70s by Parks and Donnelly to explain why bubbles created injecting ions into the superfluid were trapped onto the vortex core. Recently, the work at the Maryland by Greg Bewley, then later at Paris Univazan and Univazan, used the um, solid hydrogen particles to visualize the quantized vortices on the order of a few microns in size. The experiment I will present today uses a very similar setup, but with a few uh, um, differences. So it comprises an um, optical cryosot with five windows four on the sides and one at the bottom. But for the data we present, we just consider the side windows. The cryosot is filled with liquid helium and we inject a dilute mixture of helium gas and atmospheric air. The air frees into small particles that get trapped onto the vortices by the mechanism I just explained. And the particles are then illuminated by a laser sheet. The laser is pretty dim. It's between three and five milliwatts and the laser sheet is about one centimeter wide and 150 microns thick. The, the particles are there imaged with a low light EM CCD camera. So in this case, we use a low power laser to perturb less the system. And so this is one of the differences compared to the original setup. And the other difference is, is the injection of atmospheric air instead of hydrogen. So these injections lead to particles on the order of about uh, 500 uh, nanometers smaller than the hydrogen particles. And this is possible also because um, nitrogen particles or air, air particles scatter more light than hydrogen particles because they have an higher index of refraction. So we can do two kinds of injections. One injection into it's in the helium one, similarly to what was done with the hydrogen injection. And this creates a distribution of particles which is pretty uniform and then the system is cooled through the lambda transition. But as you cool, you start losing particles, and when you reach low temperatures, there are few particles to work with. The other uh, injection is entirely in the helium-2. This uh, in kind of injection is not as consistent as the previous injections, and leads to uh, particles which are more clamped together in um, sheet-like structures. It also leaves some space, uh, usually in the background, which is black, and this could be useful also to see the vortices more clearly, as you can see the vortex here, which is in the dark background. You can see here some of these vortices. You can recognize the vortices over a distance of a few millimeters, and you can track the motion of the vortices by tracking the motion of the particles, and you can understand which vortex uh, which particle is connected to which vortex. So 
using this visualization technique uh, was, uh, was visualized for the first time uh, uh, vortex your connection using these hydrogen particles by Buley, Pauletti, Srinivasan, and Latrop. You can see here uh, the two vortices getting together, reconnecting, and then separating quickly afterwards, as is shown here in this uh, diagram. Two vortices getting together and separating after exchanging tail. You can see an example of reconnection, and then you can see these uh, waves excited after the reconnection. So you can see the waviness of the motions in different uh, reconnection events. I let you watch a few of these uh, movies so you can get a feeling for how the this dynamics works. You can see the waviness of this motion also by the tracks. You can see here on the scale of the order of 500 uh, uh, microns, and also on the scale of uh, 40 microns, so smaller scale, this waving motion. Um, these are 2D tracks, but the recent uh, work by the, at the University of Maryland use also 3D setup that you will hear more in the talk by Dan Latrop. Um, now I want to show you also another one last movie about the Kelvin wave. You can see the wave propagating from the from the oh, it's not showing well. It was the wave propagating from the right to the left, and it was the tracked particles. By the plotting the tracked uh, positions, you get uh, this plot where you can see again uh, the waviness of the motion. And the interesting thing is that if you rescale the spatial coordinates by the square root of the quantum circulation times the time after reconnection, you get that all the points collapse on a single curve, um, telling us that um, the evolution after reconnection is a self similar process. We then want to compare with some theories, and in particular with the vortex filament model. Uh, we consider um, the curve that describes the vortex as S, parameterized by the arc length uh, sigma. And you get that the motion uh, of the vortex is given by the Biot-Savart integral. If you neglect non-local terms, you get the local induction approximation, and you get the Darius equations, where this with the prime denotes differentiation with respect to sigma. This equation has been rediscovered multiple times in the past century, um, and it describes well the motion of vortices in the zero temperature limit. However, sometimes it's working, sometimes it's not. Work? Yeah, okay. Um, So if you want to consider the, um, describe the vortices at a finite temperature where there is uh, the normal component, you have to consider an additional term, which considers also a phenomenological mutual friction coefficient. You can see here two self-similar solutions of this equation for two different, you can see um, that the, in the case for the lower alpha, you have uh, more waviness in the vortex shape compared to the more straighter version for the larger uh, value of A, of alpha. If you then define a similarity coordinate eta as the sigma divided by the square root of beta times time, 
beta here is uh, almost similar, almost equal to the quantum recirculation. You can then assume that the solution are self similar and has a shape and has a form of this kind. You get then an equation of um, this form here. And the solution of these equations are a two parameter family of curves where one parameter is the um, phenomenological mutual friction coefficient alpha, and the other is the, uh, the parameters A, which is related to the um, uh, initial curvature, as well as the angle between the interacting vortices and uh, the um, rate of separation of the two vortices. We plotted here, we wanted to overlap the curves uh, the self-similar solution to the data, and we considered um, a value of A equal 3.75, and the only uh, parameter, three parameters here are the, these A parameters, because alpha is fixed by the temperature of the fluid in which the data was collected, and then the rotation of the vortex, uh, the rotation of the curves in the plane. And so we have uh, the same value of A, the, the blue curve and the red curve. However, these are two different rotations into the plane. In the case of the red curve, we wanted to overlap both the top branch as well as the bottom branch. While in the, with the blue curve, we want to just have the best uh, overlap with the top branch. As you can see here, um, the overlap is, is quite good. The fact that it's not overlapping well with the bottom branch could be due to the fact that the, um, that the vortex was originally uh, curved, so not completely straight, or could be due to the presence of nearby vortices. We tried also just to uh, overlap with the alpha equals zero, so in the case where the, uh, there is zero temperature, just to see how it works, and it doesn't work very well. As you can see, the, there is a much deeper uh, growth and peaks compared to the data. So it doesn't work well. However, the comparison between tier experiments is, uh, is pretty good for uh, the self-similar solution of the, um, the um, uh, Yosavard as well as the local induction approximation. We then considered um, the um, intervortex spacing delta after the reconnection as a function of time for 20 reconnection events in a quiet system where the motion of the normal component was on the order of tens of uh, microns per second. And uh, for events where you can uh, identify the vortices along um, about uh, hundreds of microns in size. So where the vortices were almost completely in the field of view, in the, in the plane of the field of view. And you get uh, a one half scaling where it's represented one half by this dashed line. You can see here the straight lines of this intervortex distance. So this uh, is consistent with the assumption that the only relevant parameter for the reconnection is the quantum of circulation. So this data was uh, very different to the data collected data by Paletti et al., which uh, used a pulse counterflow to excite the vortex tangle and then look at particle pair separation to, use, to measure this delta, um, and letting decay the vortex tangle. They also consider a um, different range of scales from uh, 10 to uh, the 1 milliseconds up to 200 or 300 milliseconds, in our case, we start from about 20 or 30 milliseconds after reconnection up to two seconds after reconnection. So for a wider range of scales. In the case of Pauletti, um, they found that the delta scales in with this form, where there is a prefactor A to the one half scaling, and there is a correction factor C, which tells you how much it deviates from the one half scaling. And the distribution of this prefactor shown here, you can see from the black curve and the red curves, um, that it's uh, almost Gaussian and its peak around 1.2. Uh, 
this is very different from the distribution of uh, these 20 events that we recently observed, which you can see it's uh, distributed much flatter and has events which are uh, for values above three, something that was never observed in the 20,000 reconnection events in the work by Pauletti et al. So this is a very different and it's different because of the difference of the condition of the system. In one case, it's a quiet system with the relaxed and long vortices. In the other case is the decay of quantum turbulence after pulsing the counterflow. So the other um, reason why this could be this discrepancy is that there is a, a lesser projection effect in our data compared to the data by Paletti et al because they consider, in their case, they had a particle pair separation for the short term time scales. So you can have a motion also in the direction orthogonal to the plane of the field of view. We then consider the correction factor C, and we look at the distribution. Again, it's, um, it's uh, similar to a Gaussian, and it's picked around zero. However, it's very different from the distribution in uh, our case, where it's much more peaked around zero and all the values are negative. This uh, is uh, due to, again to the different condition of the system and suggests that the uh, correction factor to the one half scaling, so the correction factor C, depends on the influence of the neighboring vortices, which are more, much more in the case of the K of the vortex tangle, but in the case of the quiet system. We then looked at the angle dependence um, as a function um, of the prefactor A. And we measured the angle by hand by looking, uh, um, by tracking the position of the vortices. This, in some cases, was easy because the vortices are quite straight. In some cases, it was harder because the vortices are more uh, curved. And this is reflected by the difference in the um, error bar in the horizontal direction. You can see that for um, lower value of theta, so for narrower angles of reconnection, there is a higher values of A, which is consistent with the theory for which for alpha equals zero, there is also an analytical relationship between A and theta. In the case of alpha equal 0.3, um, which is uh, the value for which uh, the temperature of most of the data was collected, there is no analytical relationship, but um, there is a numerical relationship that can be computed and it's represented by this uh, red curve. You can see that the data uh, in most of the cases uh, is within the error bar to the experiments. There are a few cases which are not, um, but overall the trend is, is, is that one. Um, it's hard to say w whether um, the, the blue curve or the red curve uh, better fit the data, um, but we know that um, from the overlap of the self-similar solution of the local induction approximation with the data of the um, wave, that using an alpha equal 0.3 is, is better. So concluding, we see that um, for long straight vortices on the scale of this experiment, the dynamics of the reconnection can be described as a self-similar solution of the local induction approximation or the Piosavar equation. We know that two approaching vortices locally arrange themselves in an antiparallel configuration. Uh, but this distortion in our case can be neglected. The distribution of the correction uh, the factor C compared to that for the pulse counterflow experiment suggests that C depends on the influence of the neighboring vortices. And the reconnection behavior for long straight vortices is very different than that of the reconnection resulted from the decay of a vortex tangle. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Okay, let's thank the speaker and let's take a few questions. Do you have any questions? Yeah. I mean, the particles which you use, there are about four orders of magnitude bigger than the size of a vortex core. 
And what you are looking at in the experiment is actually motion of these particles. And these particles should experience a Stokes drag in the normal fluid. Besides, there are also forces because of added mass effects and so on. So could you please explain whether this effect of uh, particles on the track and on the shape of vortices is, is taken into account somehow? Well, the, the fact that the overlaps um, or the fact that it follows the predicted law, it implies that the effect of the particles on the uh, vortices is not as strong. Just by looking at the fact that the, the comparison between theory and experiment is pretty good. Well, as far as I remember, I mean, in Greg's Budley experiments, the propagating vortex ring did not follow the theoretical prediction because of the additional drag due to particles which have been decorated on it. So, is it just clear that the influence of particles can be neglected? Well, it depends on the kind of uh, phenomenon you want to uh, study. Okay, we can... Okay. So at lower temperature where alpha coefficient is very small, you can neglect it. But closer to the lambda point, probably this will play an essential role, right? Okay, thank you. Any other question? Yes. How did you connect the Bell's law with the Um, any other question before we close the session? Yes, Professor Lely. In, in the context of hydrodynamic vortices, uh, Kelvin waves can be either linear or nonlinear depending on the amplitude of the wave relative to its wavelength. Uh, in the present setting, it would seem that everything is nonlinear. Is that right? Uh, yes. Um... I think so, yeah. So is, is it possible to look into the data to see whether the dispersion relation of the Kelvin waves is being obeyed by the disturbance evolution that you're seeing? Yes, however, it's hard to uh, measure the dispersion relation for uh, these few vortices that we studied. So do we, we have to collect more data to have uh, statistics that you can then uh, measure the dispersion relation. In order to do so, any other question? I have a quick one. If you, you said something about two-dimensional versus 3D. When you're what, seeing a picture, yes. there would be some 3D effect also that the vortex may not be exactly in that plane. Sure. How do we uh, incorporate for that? So uh, in the case that uh, we studied, um, the effect is lesser than the previous studies because we look at uh, long straight vortices and to observe the straight vortices, they have to be in the plane of the field of view because they are on the order of several hundred microns sure. compared to the thickness of the laser sheet with 150 microns or so. So the projection effects is uh, not as big as in previous study. Thank you. If there are no other questions, we will wrap up this uh, talk. Thanks, Enrico, one more time for a nice, interesting presentation. Um.